tonight. Fatal floods. Spain endures its worst flooding disaster in decades with at least 95 people dead and dozens more missing. Festival of Light. Around 1 billion people in India and worldwide celebrate Diwali with brightly burning clay lamps and honoring hope and the victory of goodness. Ending hostilities. U.S. mediators intent on Lebanon truce as Israel bombards historic Baalbek. And introducing Ada, the futuristic innovation that brings artificial intelligence and human art together. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. A very good evening and thank you for tuning into World News Tonight. I'm Nadi Balasurya here to bring you the latest global headlines. We have several important stories to cover, starting off today's bulletin in Spain. Rescue efforts are continuing as Spain endures its worst flooding disaster in decades with at least 95 people confirmed dead and dozens more missing after huge rains swept the eastern province of Valencia and beyond. Dramatic video tonight of catastrophic flooding sweeping across parts of Spain, leaving more than 90 dead, with many residents still missing. Streets swallowed by violent waters after almost a year's worth of rain fell in a matter of hours in one town, with parts of southeastern Spain deluged by rain and hailstorm. More than 2,000 people are reported trapped. The military called in to help, with more than 1,000 personnel assisting rescue operations in Valencia. Helicopters descending into neighborhoods, airlifting some people trapped in cars and homes. Others taken to safety by boat. Tonight, rescuers working to reach some 650 people trapped inside an IKEA store. And as the water subsides in some areas, the damage widespread. Cars tossed around by the floods now piled up along the streets. Large sections of buildings, roads and bridges washed away, leaving many towns cut off. Moving to India, millions of Indians are celebrating Diwali, the festival of lights. It is one of the most popular sacred festivals in the country that has been celebrated for more than a millennium and symbolizes the triumph of light over darkness. The annual festival tends to fall between October and November, but the exact date varies each year as the Hindu calendar is based on the moon. This year, Diwali is being celebrated on Thursday, but some parts of the country will observe the festival tomorrow. People light oil lamps and candles on the day to symbolize the triumph of light over darkness and good over evil. In the lead up to Diwali, people can clean and organize their homes. New clothes are bought and sweets and gifts are exchanged with friends, families and neighbors. Many draw traditional rangolis made using colorful powders outside their doors to welcome luck and positivity. On this day, families worship Lakshmi, the Hindu goddess of wealth. Lamps are lit and windows and doors are left open to help the goddess find her way into people's homes. Fireworks are also a big part of the celebrations but in recent years several state governments have imposed curbs or banned the practice as northern Indian states grapple with severe air pollution. There is a complete ban on sale and use of firecrackers in the capital Delhi during the festival while states like Haryana, Punjab and Karnataka have limited firecracker use to specific hours on Diwali evening. Britain has detected its first case of new Mpox variant, Clade 1B. However, the country's health security agency says that the risk to the population remained low. The case in a patient who had recently travelled to affected countries in Africa was detected in London and the individual has been transferred to a specialist hospital, the UKHSA said. Close contacts of the case are being followed up by UKHSA and partner organizations. The Clade 1B variant is a new form of the virus that is linked to a global health emergency declared by the World Health Organization in August. It has been widely circulating in the Democratic Republic of Congo in recent months, and there have been cases reported in Burundi, Rwanda, Uganda, Kenya, Sweden, India and Germany 
Mpox is a viral infection that typically causes flu-like symptoms and post-field lesions. And while it's usually mild, it can kill. Russia's defense ministry said that its forces had captured the eastern Ukrainian town of Selidovy as Moscow's troops advanced closer to the key logistics hub of Pokrovsk. The capture of the frontline town of Selidovy, located around 18 kilometers southeast of Pokrovsk, is the latest battlefield gain for Russia, which has gradually taken large spots of territory in the Donetsk region. Another town falls to Moscow. Selizhoye is home to 20,000 people and is the largest of a string of villages claimed by Russian forces in recent days. It adds to the 478 square kilometres of territory seized since the start of October, Russia's highest monthly total since its full-scale invasion began in February 2022. But according to the Institute for the Study of War, the true picture of Russia's recent successes in Ukraine can be characterised by small-scale, localised advances, with significant active fighting largely along the regions of Donetsk and Luhansk. Almost daily, Russia claims a new victory, further pressuring Ukraine's depleted forces. Kyiv announced a drive on Tuesday to mobilise 160,000 troops to boost its numbers by 85 per cent. But its concerns are further exacerbated by warnings that Russia is imminently deploying more than 10,000 troops from North Korea. The Ukrainian president says this justifies the use of long-range weapons from the West against Russia. In Moscow, Russian and North Korean officials were set to hold strategic talks, fueling fears that Russia and North Korea's relationship is growing stronger and poses a global security threat. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. On the road to the White House now, Donald Trump hitting back at President Joe Biden's comment on his MSG rally addressed several thousand of his supporters in Wisconsin while wearing a garbage worker high visibility vest. There he criticized Biden, Democrats and most especially his opponent Vice President Kamala Harris for running a campaign of hate, vitriol and retribution. Vice President Kamala Harris, who visited three battleground states, tried to distance herself from the muddled remark by President Biden. Former President Trump weighing in on the firestorm over remarks by President Biden, where he appeared to call Trump supporters garbage, looking to turn Biden's controversial comments into a campaign rallying cry. Later, appearing in a garbage truck. How do you like my garbage truck? This truck is in honor of Kamala and Joe Biden. While hours earlier, Vice President Harris separating herself from the president's comments. The president made those comments last night on a Zoom event with a Latino group referencing Trump's Madison Square Garden rally. Two and a half hours later, the president posting on X, he was not referring to all Trump supporters, writing, quote, Earlier today, I referred to the hateful rhetoric about Puerto Rico spewed by Trump's supporter at his Madison Square Garden rally as garbage. That's all I meant to say. But his comments sparked a backlash. Democratic Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro reacting when he first heard the audio. While Trump and his supporters responding in real time, learning about the remark mid-rally from Senator Marco Rubio. Just moments ago, Joe Biden stated that our supporters are garbage. That's terrible. Trump comparing the remark to Hillary Clinton's 2016 comment calling Trump supporters deplorables. Garbage, I think, is worse, right? Still in the U.S., five people have been accused of running a million-dollar fraud ring that allowed hundreds of unqualified Texas educators to cheat on their state certification tests. More than 300 unqualified teachers were able to get jobs or promotions at schools across the state under the board scheme in which impersonators were paid to take more than 400 certification exams for them. 
Parents and students in Houston stunned to learn some of their educators are accused of running a million dollar fraud ring. Got to be careful, people. In my class, everyone was like gathered up, reading it off one phone. Harris County District Attorney Kim Ogg announcing this week that five people, including two assistant principals, have been charged in an alleged scheme that let hundreds of people cheat on their state certification tests. A respected high school basketball coach, Vincent Grayson, is the alleged ringleader. Prosecutors say it worked like this. People struggling to pass certification tests would pay Grayson or the others alleged involved $2,500. Up to 500 of that was used to bribe officials at the testing center. Then on testing day, the candidate would sign in and show an ID as usual, but then leave, allowing assistant principal Nicholas Newton to take their place and ace that test. Prosecutors say since 2020, more than 400 fraudulent exams were taken on behalf of 200 teachers, while the scheme raked in thousands for those involved. Grayson Newton Newton and three others have been charged with two felony counts each of engaging in criminal activity, according to the district attorney. NBC News has not been able to reach attorneys for Grayson or Newton. An attorney for LaShonda Roberts, accused of personally funneling at least 90 teachers into the scheme, says the accusations are, quote, unsubstantiated claims and that the truth will come to light. But the scheme authorities call a pay to pass scam potentially put kids in real danger. But amid such a deep breach of trust, it was ultimately a good Samaritan who cracked this case open for authorities. On the updates from the Middle East now, continuous Israeli strikes have killed 19 people, including eight women, around Lebanon's eastern city of Baalbek. It came hours after residents fled in response to evacuation orders issued by the Israeli ministry. This is Doris, about three kilometers southwest of the city of Baalbek in eastern Lebanon. Israeli airstrikes hit the town on Wednesday following forced evacuation threats from the Israeli military, telling the nearly 85,000 residents of the historic city of Baalbek to leave or face bombing. A UNESCO heritage site, the city of Baalbek is home to the Roman-era temple of Venus, Jupiter and Bacchus, dating back nearly 2,000 years. Known as the City of the Sun because of its unique temples, this once well-known tourist attraction is about 70 kilometers northeast of the capital Beirut. This is not the first time Israel has attacked this area. On Monday, one of the biggest attacks here killed at least 60 people, most of them civilians. As Baalbek came under attack, the newly appointed Secretary General of the Armed Group Hezbollah released his inaugural pre-recorded speech, vowing the group will continue to fight. The latest area of Lebanon to come under Israeli attacks is one of the oldest and most historic in the country. Baalbek is known to be a stronghold of Hezbollah, but it is the civilian population that continues to pay the price. The UN says Lebanon risks falling off what it called a humanitarian cliff, with nearly one and a half million Lebanese already forced from their homes inside the country, including 500,000 children and nearly 3,000 people killed and over 10,000 injured. Meanwhile, U.S. mediators are working on a proposal to halt hostilities between Israel and Lebanon's Hezbollah, starting with a 60-day ceasefire. Israel on Wednesday began heavy airstrikes on the historic city of Baalbek in Lebanon. As U.S. mediators work on a proposal to halt hostilities between Israel and Lebanese armed group Hezbollah. That's according to two sources who spoke to Reuters that say it would start with a 60-day ceasefire. Later on Wednesday, State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller commented on Israel's latest actions. The sources Reuters spoke to also say a possible two-month ceasefire period would be used to finalize full implementation of UN Security Council Resolution 1701. It was adopted to try and end an earlier 2006 war between Israel and Hezbollah and to help keep southern Lebanon free of weapons or forces outside control of Lebanon's government. However, it was never fully enforced and has sparked friction with Hezbollah as the group effectively controls that area. Lebanon's prime minister expressed hope that a ceasefire deal with Israel would be announced within days. 
as Israel's public broadcaster published what it said was a draft agreement of a truce. The effort comes as Naim Qasim, Hezbollah's new leader, said in his first speech that the Iran-backed group would agree to a ceasefire within certain parameters if Israel wanted to stop the war, but added that Israel had so far not agreed to any proposal that could be discussed. The latest ceasefire efforts come as Israel's operation against Hezbollah in Lebanon continues to expand. It also comes days before the U.S. presidential election and in parallel with a similar diplomatic drive on Gaza. Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi held talks with his Finnish counterpart Elena Waltonen in Beijing. Minister Wang said that China hopes Finland can play a constructive role in urging the European Union to avoid politicizing economic and trade issues, properly resolve differences through dialogue and consultation, and jointly safeguard the overall situation of China-EU relations. Wang, also a member of the political bureau of the Communist Party of China Central Committee, made the statement at talks with visiting Finnish Foreign Minister Elina Valtonen in Beijing. Wang recalled that in 2017, the heads of state of the two countries jointly decided to elevate China-Finland relations to a future-oriented new type cooperative partnership, which is unique in China's foreign relations and fully reflects the distinctiveness and adaptability of the China-Finland relationship. Wang noted that Finnish President Alexander Stubbs' state visit to China, accompanied by a high-profile delegation, including the foreign minister, is not only a continuation of friendship but also an opportunity to expand cooperation. Further adding, he said that the foreign ministries of the two countries should maintain close communication and coordination, implement the important consensus reached by the two heads of state, strengthen mutually beneficial corporations in various fields, jointly tackle global challenges, and contribute to promote promoting China-Finland relations to a higher level. Wang also highlighted the importance of the EU's imposition of tra Wang also highlighted the importance of the EU's imposition of tariffs on Chinese electric vehicles, obviously violates World Trade Organization rules and the principle of free trade, noting that China has always believed that a universally beneficial and inclusive economic globalization is in the interests of all parties involved. Valtonen said Finland looks forward to working closely with China to implement the important consensus reached by the two heads of state, strengthen cooperation in areas such as low carbon, green energy and circular economy, and jointly address global challenges such as climate change. In his remarks, Valtonen also said as a member of the EU, Finland hopes that EU-China relations will maintain constructive development and supports both sides in strengthening cooperation and properly handling differences. It is expected that China will play a greater role in resolving international hotspot issues such as the Ukraine crisis. In Bolivia, supporters of former President Evo Morales have been blocking roads and calling on the current leader, Luis Arce, to resign. Protesters block roads and march in the streets of Bolivia. <laughs> defending their former president, Evo Morales, and calling for the current president to quit. Morales supporters are angry about an ongoing investigation into sexual abuse allegations against the former president. Blockades have become a common means of protest, but for some Bolivians, the unrest is unwelcome. Police in other parts of the country came face to face with protesters while trying to clear the roads, firing tear gas in an attempt to disperse the crowds. President Luis Arce has condemned the protest, insisting they won't compel him to step down. It was earlier this week that Mr Morales accused the government of trying to assassinate him, but the government claims his convoy shot at police first. Mr Morales and Mr Arce were once allies, but their relationship has become strained. Both intend to run in next year's elections, but they still belong to the same political party. And as the political rift continues to grow between their factions, the conflict threatens to divide the people of Bolivia. Argentine state employees, led by the Association of State Workers, began a 36-hour strike to protest against layoffs, low wages and budget cuts by President Javier Millet's new government. 
The Association of State Workers, or ATE, which is Argentina's largest union of public employees, called for the protest, which began with a march from the obelisk of Buenos Aires in the country's capital to the Ministry of Deregulation and State Transformation. The group announced that the strike will include air, rail and subway workers in Buenos Aires, beginning midnight on Wednesday, while bus drivers will also join the protest from Thursday. The ATE is demanding that Millet's government prevent the state from being taken over by large business groups. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. And finally tonight, can a machine create art? Ada, a humanoid robot artist, will make history this month when Sotheby's auctions one of its paintings, the first time a major auction house sells a robot's artwork. The work, called AI Gold, is a seven-foot-tall impressionistic portrait depicting the father of modern computing, Alan Turing. It is anticipated to fetch between $120,000 to $180,000. Ada Robo, named after Ada Lovelace, the first computer programmer, is the brainchild of Aidan Miller, who says she's intended to spark a conversation about how we interact with technology and artificial intelligence and said this is a significant moment. Miller said they're absolutely in the transitional point of going from a human world where humans make all the decisions to a post-human world where the algorithms are starting to make all the decisions. The process involved Ada painting several small portraits of Alan Turing, which were then combined and scaled up onto a large canvas. Studio assistants then add a finish to the artwork by adding paint and texture. Finally, Ada Robo paints on the top of canvas, adding new marks and texture. When asked if it's art, Mello replied that it's up to the audience to decide. He also added that their focus is an ethical arts project that explores the current beginning of the fourth industrial revolution. Whether culture enthusiasts will embrace AI artwork remains to be seen. Sotheby's digital art sale, which also features contributions from generative artists like Xcopy, PAK and Rific Anadel, will be held online from October 31st to November 7th, 2024. And that concludes today's bulletin. Join us again tomorrow for the latest updates from around the world. Until then, thank you for watching and have a great night.